HRN listeners. As we celebrate our 15th year, we are deepening our commitment to giving voice to the next generation of food system storytellers, and we need your help. Our internship and fellowship programs help activate new possibilities for underrepresented and underestimated young people through experiential journalism, audio engineering, and production training. Through these unique programs, HRN helps food equity stewards build essential workforce readiness skills that expand their potential and foster economic mobility. Please consider supporting these critical programs. And with a minimum donation, you can be entered to win a dinner for two at an amazing restaurant in one of eight cities and tickets to a concert at a great venue in one of those cities. We have incredible partners across the country who have donated as they also share our passion for helping to educate the next generation of food system storytellers. Check out heritageradionetwork.org 15 to donate and enter to win today. That's heritageradionetwork.org 15 to donate and enter to win today. And make sure you donate before March 31st. Thank you. This episode is brought to you with support from Fairplate. Tickets and information at F-A-R-E-P-L-A-T-E dot com. You're listening to Heritage Radio Network. We're a member-supported podcast network broadcasting over 35 weekly shows live from Bushwick, Brooklyn. This year, we're celebrating 10 years of food radio. For the past decade, we've been taking you behind the scenes of farms, restaurants, breweries, school cafeterias, and more. It's been 10 years, and we're just getting started. Find us at heritageradionetwork.org. Hey, hey, hey. Welcome to Beer Sessions Radio on the Heritage Radio Network. Hey, guys. I'm Jimmy Carboni. I'm the host of Beer Sessions Radio. Today is Tuesday, March 5th, 2019. And yes, this is the 10th anniversary of HeritageRadioNetwork.org. So this is a special show. Uh, Our good buddy, Jamie Adams, he's a brewer at St. James Brewery on Long Island in New York, is part of a a deep water diving crew. Jamie, welcome to the show. Oh, thank you for having us, Jimmy. It's great to be here. You know, last time you were on a couple months ago, you just mentioned at the end of the show that, oh, by the way, you've been diving for bottles and you and you made beer uh, with some of the yeast. I threw that little teaser out there for you because I was hoping that uh, we'd get to be able to explore this uh, episode, and I'm really happy that we're... So the, the backstory is, who wants to give us the backstory? Guys, everyone introduce themselves who's in the room. Uh, I'm Captain Pat Rooney. Um, Captain Andy Favada. Captain Tom McCarthy. All right, so Andy, tell us the backstory on this wreck. Uh, the backstory on this wreck, uh, I've been diving this wreck since I was 18 years old, and it happened to be one of the loves of uh, my life, diving this wreck. Um, it sank in 1886 in 130 feet of water. So it was the Oregon, it was a, a it Cunard was the, line out of uh, correct. Liverpool in England. That is correct. Yep, and uh, it was just a, a passion of mine ever since I started diving to dive this wreck and the uh, artifacts that we recover off of this wreck are incredible. What are some of the typical artifacts that, that you guys bring up or that other divers look for? Uh, well, there's china, there's uh, brass portholes, um, there's uh, numerous amount of artifacts uh, that could be recovered, you know, personal baggage, cargo areas, and uh, uh, just the, the canard passenger liner itself, you know. So it must be amazing that you guys were able to find some beer bottles. Who wants to tell us the story of when you guys realized that there were actual bottles and there there was some kind of a kitchen bar area with with bottles of all types, right? Whiskey, water. Um, yeah, there were multiple uh, bottles that were recovered um, over the past years. Um, when we happened upon the the, uh, the bottles, uh, we were finding ale bottles. We were finding aerated spring water bottles. Uh, Congress from uh, Saratoga, New York. There were bottles. Um, and also we found uh, canard whiskey bottles also with wine bottles. That's great. And our own friend, we've got a friend calling in from England, uh, my favorite beer writer, uh, Pete Brown from England. <laughs> oh, shucks, you're embarrassing me. Hi, uh, how you doing? How are you, man? Pete, par- part of this whole journey has been that, you know, these guys f- found these bottles on the 1886 wreck and... Um, We've been wondering, you know, what, what beer that might have been. It seemed that they're British beers. What, what do you think those the beers might have been on that, that luxury liner back then? 
Well, we were exporting a lot of beer at that time. Um, but as you say, it was probably for consumption on the liner itself. Um, I think at the time, the two biggest beer brands in the world were, were Bass Pale Ale uh, and Guinness. So there's a high chance that uh, they would have been uh, on there as well. Um, but um, I, I guess you guys, I heard a rumour that you're thinking maybe it's uh, Allsop's beer. Uh, that, that's a, a brand that's very close to my heart um, because they were the first IPA to go uh, from Burton-on-Trent to India uh, in the 1820s. And I recreated that journey about 10 years ago. Uh, and their beers went out of Liverpool. Uh, Burton-on-Trent is in the north of England. It's quite a landlocked place. Uh, and Liverpool was the nearest port. So there's a good chance it would have been uh, an Allsop or a Bass. Uh, these beers would have been, at the time, they would have been uh, referred to as IPA, uh, probably quite different than the IPA that we, we're we familiar with now, though. Whereas we now kind of love fresh, hoppy flavours, these beers were designed to age and the kind of lovely, fresh, vibrant aromas that we like now in these beers, they would have considered them uh, too too, too fresh, too raw, uh, not ripened yet. So they were kind of waiting for these flavours to kind of die down uh, and age, which, which they did on the journey. Wow. And, uh, Captain Tom, so you did a little research into what some of the provisions on this boat were. Yeah, so uh, we actually uh, went over to Scotland and uh, tried, <laughs> tried doing as much research as we could. Um, unfortunately, there's not a lot um, that's still left as far as you know, operational documents, that you know, provisions and muster rolls and things like that. Um, but, yeah, we, we, uh, we got some deck plans and whatnot, and um, you know, that definitely confirmed that what we were finding was from a cargo area. Um, you know, it's it's very close to where the dining room was, so so we think that it wasn't necessarily something that was being exported, but was something that was being drank on the ship itself. Um, but yeah, it's uh, you know j- just from from just doing some preliminary research, um, you know, the shape of the bottles and, and looking at uh, different types of bottles that we can find, um, we, we thought that it, it looked pretty close to the Alsace bottles and, and um, it, specifically they had like a, it was an Arctic ale um, bottle that, that was actually um, the, the, the real uh, kind of close match to what we have. Um, the, the top's a little different, but it's, it's the same kind of stubby shaped bottle. Um, but yeah, th- there's a really interesting backstory with that, but you know, that, that was, uh, f- about a couple decades earlier. So there's the potential that, that's well, you know, t- that's yeah. interesting because, uh, and P we've, we've been Twittering with Ron Pattinson of the Barkley Perkins blog. And he said yeah. the same thing. He thought it might be Alsop's IPA. But what's the backstory, Tom? I don't, so Can't leave me hanging like that. <laughs> so apparently, the uh, there's an Alsop's bottle that um, it was. They brewed some beer for an Arctic expedition, and uh, one of the bottles sell, sold for like half a million dollars, something like that, um, in the last couple of years. I think on eBay, and there's there's more to that with the uh, spelling misspelling on the bottle, and it. it Wait, so you guys kind of like you're almost like you're diving and you're like Indiana Jones. You're actually looking for things of value. So like uh, Andy, you, you were talking about what's it like finding bottles? I mean, I can't believe that this this ship went down in 1886, and you still found bottles that that Jamie was able to pull liquid from. I mean, Andy, did you say you you've actually had some bottles of wine that are? I mean, Pat, some bottles of wine that are still drinkable. Um, they, I don't know if they're still drinkable, but uh, when I was pouring one of the uh, wine bottles out, uh, it was very clear to see that um, the aroma that was coming out of the bottle was like pure wine, and I stopped pouring it out at that point. And uh, it's clear it wasn't compromised from the salt water, you know, from when we retrieved it. And so I still have that couple of wine bottles. So how do you home. get the bottles? Out? I mean, are they... Are they are they exposed? Are they covered in mud? Uh, well, we ran a... Uh, I, I put a bunch of guys, you know, good close friends together, and we went out there one year uh, with a dredge, an underwater dredge, and we started dredging this area, and we were recovering all of these bottles, different types of bottles, uh, like I said, Congress spring waters and uh, torpedo bottles that actually had Ruth, Ruthkin and Sons um, on the bottle in Boast, and it was to the royal family, um, that's what's imposed hmm. on these torpedo bottles. Pete, do you know what that is, Ruskin and Sons? I haven't heard of those guys in particular, but um, what used to happen was that the beer would be aged in barrels, and uh, wholesalers, merchants would buy the barrels. And then bottling the beer was almost as much of a, a sort of regarded skill 
uh, as brewing it in the first place. So bottlers would have their own brand names on the bottles. Bottlers would say, we are the best bottling of this particular beer. Uh, and they would get a reputation themselves. So, so that's what's going on there. I could understand that. And then, uh, Tom, didn't you mention you, you did find some other bottles that had a, a mark on it from the glassmaker or bottler? Yeah, I mean, one of the one of the ways that you know you identify bottles in general, um, you know, there's there's different manufacturing types that are through specific years, um, but then makers marks, you know, on the on the base of the bottle is what we've been looking at, and you know, we we were hoping that it would it would nail it down to a specific bottler, but. You know, it's, it's interesting. We have multiple bottles of the same shape and size with different markings underneath. So what, what he just said was, you know, that, that actually does make a lot of sense, potentially, yeah. yeah. But what was one that you found with an N on uh, it? We had one with an N. And, and I got Pat, one uh, with an O, o and an L o attached L, yeah. to the, the O. What, what did you think the N was? I think you mentioned it to me. The N? Um, oh, yeah. A li- there was a Liverpool bottler. Yeah, there's, there's a, a... It's actually a glass maker, from what I understand. Um... Uh, Nuttall, I think, is is one of them that it, it potentially could have been. Um, yeah. So, Pete, we, we need your help because these guys, <laughs> they're, they're divers, but they did a little bit of research. But uh, I went to Scotland, still couldn't figure it out. Help us. <laughs> and here's, here's Jamie, the here's Jamie the brewer, St. James. Jamie. Uh, hi, Pete. Uh, we also have bottles with uh, the color of the beer inside is is different, uh, dark to amber to light. Uh, again, with the same different markings on the bottoms uh-huh. of, of each bottle. So in, in a sense, we've got a light bottle and, a, and maybe perhaps a dark bottle with the same marking underneath, uh, and then an amber bottle and a dark bottle with the same uh, 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 different marking uh, at the bottom. So the, the, the riddle has kind of deepened a little bit in terms of, is this not just a different brewery beer for each mark, but rather we might have breweries that are producing two different beers uh, uh, Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, uh, I found a, uh, I found a bro- well, I was given a, a brewer's price list from about 1900. And we think of brewers nowadays making a, a wide range of beers. And they didn't necessarily have the same style indications that we have now. But um, uh, there's this brewer in Yorkshire, and their price list from, from 1900 just had about 15 different beers on there. Uh, I, I think Porter uh, was, was still very popular. We, we tend to think that Porter went out of favour when IPA came in. Uh, that's not really true. IPA was always the most celebrated beer, um, but Porter was being shipped in huge quantities as well. Uh, and when you see some of the old adverts, um, I mean, my, my specialism was, was looking at India. And when you see these ships arriving in India around the same time, uh, they had a whole bunch of different beers on, including some kind of low-strength session beers, and, uh, and cider and, and all sorts of different things. So it doesn't surprise me that you've got uh, maybe one brewery producing three or four different beers, and they have these uh, notations like double X and triple X and four X and things like that. Um, yeah, different beers go to the same bottler or to different bottlers. Right. It, it gets quite complex. Now, did, so this is Captain Tom. Um, the, the bottled style that we have, um, just from research, we, we found that they were kind of uh, colloquially called uh, porter bottles, but I, 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 I also don't know if that is necessarily, um, you know, it has to be a porter that's inside of that bottle. You're ahead of me on that one. Uh, <laughs> I, <laughs> I, I haven't got that deeply into it, I'm afraid. No, I, but I would, I would imagine so. I would imagine so. I don't think there was uh, as much rigor uh, about sort of that, the, the, the notions of style and things like that then as, as there was now. But of course, the, the bottling itself was a big skill, and the bottle making was a big skill, because these beers were all, all by definition, they were bottle conditioned. Uh, there was still live beer working away uh, in the bottle. Uh, it's interesting that around the time this ship went down, that was just when uh, Carlsberg were perfecting the, were building on the work of uh, Louis Pasteur uh, to, to get pasteurization. And around 1883, Kelsberg were the first people to start pasteurizing their beer. Um, and, and so all these bottles were, were bottle conditioned. So the glass had to be strong. It was a real uh, skill to make bottles that you knew weren't going to explode on the ship. Uh, so so you, you're into a, a very important area here. That's great. Pete, uh, Captain Pat, what were you ta- you, you, you've seen so many of these bottles. Well, even like the round, uh, the torpedo bottles that we were finding, um, we were told they were like ginger beer bottles, and um, there was no markings on these bottles at all. 
But back in the day, back in the early, you know, the, the mid 1800s, they had the ginger beer. So we're kind of like at a, a crossroads right here, right now, that we can't really figure out, you know, where it all came from, you know. And it's uh, it's kind of difficult, you know. Andy, Captain Andy, you've found some uh, ginger beer bottles, the round bottom ones, and uh, it's it's tough to figure out where where it all comes from, you know. And that's why we're trying to search and find out, you know, where <coughs> where it originates from. You know, the hole is interesting because it has so many different bottles in it. So it, it wasn't like there was just a case of ale there was a case of porter whatever they, they were all interspersed so when you're digging in the hole you it's potluck and you know and so this is part of the ship that's kind of like settled and there's there's things have turned to mud and there's muck so it's chocolate pudding that you and you literally it. said you go down there and with your hands you're pulling your eyes are closed and out. you pull them out and uh, it's potluck and you put them in a bag and when you get on a boat you that's when the, that's when you figure out that you actually have a mystery that you have to start Figuring mm. out what is it, where did it come from, why is it here? But this is a, Pat, Pat. This is a well-known wreck. So this is the Oregon off of Long Island. Correct. Um, a lot of people. You said you started diving there. What back in the? Uh, I was eighteen 80s years or 90s? old. Yeah, no, eighteen years old. I guess I was. Uh, well, let me date myself. 80, 80, Slightly you, after you know. the ships. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then Jamie, let's just, so, Jamie. So quickly, um, <laughs> we're gonna also gonna talk about the process of you, just, you know, getting this yeast. Uh, just tell us, we're, we're going to give us an intro, but what's the beer that you made for us first? And that's going to give us an intro into what you were doing. Thank you, Jimmy. I don't even see how you can pull away from the, from the <laughs> interesting of the art, you know, the, the part of the adventure. Uh, but what I've poured first is, uh, this was our first attempt, uh, our quote-unquote test batch uh, that we did last year uh, to uh, find out if this yeast was actually even viable. Uh, did we have something? That was really the question at the time. Did we have something that we could... Uh, that we could use and that we could work with going into the future. Uh, so this is the first uh, batch that we made, and the, the, the gist of this was uh, twofold. We wanted to determine if uh, this was something that we could brew with uh, first, and uh, secondly, we wanted to determine that we could do it over and over again, that, that we had a product or we had a yeast strain that uh, would have some longevity that we could uh, that we could work with it over a long period of time. Well, so this is great. So we're going to take a short break, be back in a minute, and talk more about the mystery of this yeast on Beer Sessions Radio. Hold on, Pete. We'll be back with you, too. Okay. This episode is brought to you with support from Fairplate. A Taste of Ireland in New York, taking place Saturday, March 9th at the Rag Trader. At Fair Plate, you can sip and savor Irish whiskey, cheese, grass-fed beef, and more. Tickets and information at F-A-R-E-P-L-A-T-E dot com. Are you enjoying this podcast? Heritage Radio Network has plenty more. Hi, my name is Sam Ben Ruby, and I'm the host of The Great Nation on Heritage Radio Network. With this show, we bring wine to the people. Each week, we bring the best guests in wine on, taste different wines on air, and invite our listeners to taste with us. You'll find our approach to wine decidedly unsnobby. You can find The Grape Nation wherever you listen to podcasts and on heritageradionetwork.org. Hey, hey, hey. Welcome back to Beer Sessions Radio on the Heritage Radio Network. This is a special show. We've got Pete Brown from England. We're talking about the shipwreck yeast that was discovered off the coast of Long Island. So, Jamie, uh, St. James Brewery, you, you, you tell us the process of, of taking the yeast from the bottles and how you made the first batch. Just so talk we, us through it. We've had this great adventure, and uh, we, we've gone down. The ship has opened itself up to us, and we were able to pull these bottles out of the, out of the, uh, uh, the hole, as we call it, the bottle hole. Uh, and from there, it was really... Um, keeping the yeast in mind first and foremost, keeping the health and the well-being of the yeast in mind. And that started right from the very beginning. So these bottles, they were corked. Do they actually have beer in them? They were corked. They had beer in them. And uh, 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 like the guys were discussing earlier, the reason why they were so valuable was their proximity. Uh, it stuck in the mud where they were and how the mud, this this mud, was actually keeping them uh, intact, keeping somewhat of a pressure on it, but that would keep the cork in. But at the same time, um, not 
applying so much pressure that it would uh, crack the bottles. We found so many cracked bottles and broken bottles that uh, to find them intact like this, it was really something special. And we had to treat it as such, uh, and that's what we tried to do from the, from the onset. So you, when you find your perfect bottle, what are the next steps? Uh, the first step is to is when we recover it to to bring it to the surface in a in a manner that is somewhat safe, where we don't want to jostle it around too much. We don't want it to have any accidents on the it might explode on the extension, anything like that. And once you get it to the surface, you really want to <coughs> keep it uh, cold, and you want to keep it out of the sunlight, and you want to do your best to keep it. Has in that the happened air. to you, Andy? You you've you brought up bottles <laughs> and they've exploded on you. Had a change in pressure. A uh, couple of nice, beautiful uh, bottles. We lost yeah. several. <laughs> so that, that's really the trick, is to, is to keep them cold and keep them in the environment that as best you can as where they had come from. From there, uh, we bring them back to the laboratory, we bring them back, and we, uh, we extract the yeast using scientific methods, Petri dishes, we plate it out, we uh, used test tubes. Uh, so you, the, do you open the bottle and pour the beer out? Well, we don't pour the beer out. We open up the bottle and we uh, we uh, stick an apparatus into the bottle, which will uh, basically pull some of the yeast out from from the bottom. Is how we want to do that. Uh, from there, it's like a little syringe or something. Yeah, yeah. It's called an inoculating loop. Uh, it's just a little piece of metal. It's got a loop on the bottom, and it'll just it'll just pull off the the yeast. However. Although these bottles were corked uh, and everything that that came along, they were, were well preserved under the under the the seafloor. Uh, there was some saltwater intrusion, and it's inevitable that there's uh, some stuff that's going to get in there. So it was our job really to uh, at first separate the yeast from all of the other ancillary uh, things that were that were there. Uh, and it took us uh, a few months to do that. And what we would do is we would uh, plate the yeast successively, petri dish to petri dish, finally getting a, a somewhat clean culture that we could then uh, isolate one single stra- uh, yeast cell from. Wow. And I'm going to go back to Pete. Um, Pete, I know you've done, you've written a lot about beer history. Uh, first, tell us a couple of the books that we, we should reference. And also, um, mm. have you had any other stories of people going back to old bottles and old yeasts and, and making beers from them? Absolutely. So uh, this reminds me of two of my books. Hops and Glory is the one where I retraced the journey uh, of India Pale Ale to Calcutta, um, which was an astonishing adventure. Uh, happy life stayed above the water rather than under it. Um, <laughs> but, but the other one is that uh, last time I spoke to you, Jimmy, we, we were talking about my book, uh, Miracle Brew, where I did a deep dive on the, so to speak, on the, each of the four main ingredients of beer. And when I was working on yeast in that, around that time, uh, Carlsberg were doing something very similar. They'd found old bottles in their cellar from some of the first um, uh, brews they'd done with, with, the, with the first ever single strain yeasts after they'd done just what you were describing, uh, isolating a single yeast cell in a petri dish and then cultivating it back up. And they found bottles in their cellar which had live yeast cultures in them. So they did this thing that they called rebrew, uh, and they, they tried to go back and recreate Carlsberg as it was in 1883, and uh, with, with the kind of malts that they would have had then, the kind of hops they would have had then, uh, the water from the local area. And it was, it was interesting, but, you know, Carlsberg's not the most characterful beer in the world. Um, it's, it's clean, it's consistent. And so the beer they recreated from 1883 was, was clean and consistent because that's what they were trying to do in 1883. So I think this experiment might, uh, I think what, what you're doing here might throw up something uh, just as fascinating from a scientific point of view, but uh, maybe a bit more tasty as well. Yeah, it, it is. Uh, Jamie, the, just the first beer you made, is it available for sale? And, and what's, you have a special line coming out? The first beer was the, the test beer for our new uh, line of beers called Deep Ascent. Uh, that that's our brand name. It's our new brand name for our English uh, line of beers uh, that we're going to put out. Uh, it's uh, 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 deep ascent uh, is is reference to the yeast itself, uh, and uh, we're going to promote it through. Um, so what style is this? This is a, a pale ale. So well, t- you know, it kind of goes back to our story again about the yeast and and what is it. And uh, we can we can sit back and look at the bottles and try and look at the markings and decipher what it is. But another way that we can try and figure out what the yeast is is through sensory analysis, the taste, the smell, uh, the 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 
the general essence of the beer. So when we uh, were finally able to start brewing our batches of beer, that's when the, the, we could really start to uh, narrow down the field. Uh, because keep in mind, we've got a, a cruise ship, a uh, Cunard liner that's going from England to America and back. And we have two distinct beer cultures here. We've got our English ale culture on the one side with Cunard. Uh, but then on the other side, this was, uh, at, uh, even though it was, the ship was built in Scotland, this was an American company initially called Guillaume, which had built the ship and owned the ship uh, uh, in, its, in its brief uh, history, in its brief service life of three years, uh, that, that initially had the ship uh, with all of the other American provisions on it. So we could have had the American uh, uh, style of beers, which were German, highly German-influenced, uh, uh, or an English style of beer. We really weren't sure. But once we started to brew with the beer, uh, almost immediately it was clear through the, uh, the smell, the taste, how the, beer, how the yeast performed, that this was English, uh, English yeast. So this, this is a nice ale that you made. Yes. So, so P, we're drinking an ale with some nice flavor. And any of the guys, the divers, when you're on the boat, would you drink a beer like this? You know, what, what did you used to drink on the boat before you met Jamie? Before we met Jamie, I thought, <laughs> can, I, can I say the brand name? Go for it. I thought Bex was the greatest thing ever, and Jamie told me it was junk. And uh, I gained a, about 20 pounds since then. I go, oh, drink anything Jamie told me to drink, because he's the beer meister. This is before craft beer was cool. <laughs> Yeah, and, and, and Pete, did the, some sauce. backstory on that. You, um, so Alsips, you, you've mentioned Alsips, and Ron Patterson mentioned it. The Alsips. Um, is it true? Did um, Brewdog buy the patent or the the brand for for Alsips? Um, uh, they have bought some patent, uh, some brands, yes. Um, but there's some other stuff going on there that I, I, I'm not at liberty to talk about at the moment. It's quite interesting. There's some things going on. Oh, I, I may or may not be involved in, a, uh, in an effort to, uh, to, to, to do something else for the Allsops so, back. So, I think you're so, going to see Allsops back. One way or another, you're going to see Allsops So back. you're saying that our friend Jamie here at St. James Brewery in Long Island might have some Allsops yeast isolated. Uh, I mean, that's going to be really... <laughs> yeah, so let's jump. So, Amy, and we're getting sued. Yeah. <laughs> and Jamie, the, the, the next beer you made. So, you made a second beer, and, and you actually are you selling this beer? Uh, so, this is our second beer, which we are selling to the public. It's called Fleur de Lis. Um, St. James Brewery, uh, first and foremost, is a farm brewery. So, we work with local farmers, but we're really known for making our Belgian style beers. Uh, uh, so, our Fleur de Lis is uh, this is a crossroads where we, uh, on the one hand, we're working with our English style yeast. We are uh, um, assessing its te- its technical uh, advantages and disadvantages, uh, and uh, we decided to make this beer in more of a Belgian IPA style to take advantage of the of the flavor profile that that this English yeast uh, afforded to us, but also to uh, get the uh, attenuation characteristics of our of our house Belgian yeast. So again, you're going beyond Carlsberg. You're, you're going for interesting ales. You know what's great about this this kind of show is that literally a week ago I didn't know anything about this and besides between talking to Pete Brown and Ron Pattinson, I know now about Alsip's IPA and I, I never had Pete Brown uh, speechless before, <laughs> so I won't ask you about that. But I, I got Captain Pat here. You, you're kind of a legend, and now that we've set the stage, you know, tell us about you as a diver. I mean, there's some magical stories of like the Andrea Doria. There, there's some famous wrecks. Yeah, um, I, I, you know, uh, my parents got me involved in diving when I was uh, 15 years old. And from there, it just kind of turned into, uh, uh, it, it turned into an obsession. A obses- problem? It, 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 yeah, it was a problem, <laughs> yes. Um, and you had your leg bit <laughs> off by a shark once. You know, uh, it, it turned into an obsession of mine. Uh, the history that we have off of Long Island is is absolutely incredible. And uh, I just can't get enough. It when I was in high school, I hated history. I actually cut out for six six weeks and got caught. But now I can't get enough of history. But diving the Oregon is is just, you know, the stuff that we recover off of the Oregon is incredible, and you don't see stuff like that today. And uh, to, the to... problem that we have today tonight uh, going on is we're not drinking out of the original bottles, <laughs> yeah. you know. Uh, but that's, that's my fault. Wait, so what do you uh, do? You, you take the artifacts. <laughs> And you, you pour your, you pour drinks into them and drink, well, drink from them? Yeah. You know, if we came up with empty bottles, um, even like on the Andrea Doria, um, 
we had first class china, second class china, third class china. And we were, we were actually finding glasses, you know, crystalware. And we would drink out of these glasses when we brought them up. And even eating dinner out of some of the dishes that we brought up. You know, and uh, it's just, it's bringing back the history and just being part of that time. That just, it's, there's nothing like it. You yeah. know, there's, there's nothing like it. You know, one, of, one of the funny things about this 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 uh, this wreck is, you know, it predates the Titanic by <laughs> almost oh, three decades. Absolutely. I mean, we were I, we, I go to the Luxor where they have the Titanic exhibit, and I'm walking around, and I'm going, we've got one of those, we've got one of those. I mean, it's it's, and and they're newer than what we've got. Uh, you know, it's 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 it was a it was a world class steamship at the time and and the history with it's amazing i mean it it was fixing the the generator uh, which we called it the dynamo on this wreck was on on this ship when it was in new york harbor was nikola tesla's first job in the united states working for thomas edison i mean you, you don't hear about that wow it's a time capsule that we get to visit we this the artifacts aren't necessarily valuable for monetary reasons but for uh, I have a porthole from the Oregon uh, it's a it's a treasure, treasure thing for me the effort it took the guys I was with the times we had the beer we drank on the way back it's camaraderie it, it, of, of <laughs> friends it's as you know important it's, uh, as, almost as important as the diving is yeah. actually probably is more important than that, <laughs> and, and Jamie how'd you get involved in this I the whole thing is that you because of you now we we're, we're drinking a beer yeah with yeah the yeast my, from that ship uh, my I I kind of came in the side door with this um, to be honest with you I uh, I was living in, in New York City and I worked uh, I was a Wall Street guy that's all I I did and all I knew uh, for the most part and all I was happy doing uh, but uh, uh, after September 11th I had just had this absolute calling to go scuba diving don't know why I I didn't really much enjoy going to the beach or anything like that i just felt like i had to go scuba diving and my uh my wife got me a gift certificate to learn how to scuba dive at one of the most technically advanced scuba shops unbeknownst to any of us <laughs> in, on long island and that's where i met these guys uh andrew actually uh, captain andrew here was uh was one of our first uh was the first no you were one of the you were the one first influential scuba diving instructor that we had uh, you know, and I was just hooked, and that's how I kind of got into the group. And uh, all I wanted to do was get a sea card, go on vacation. You know, and you're still doing it. Yeah, and it's great. <laughs> well, this, is a, this, this has been guys. a very interesting episode for me. Um, I'm because it gives me a chance to talk to Pete Brown and and learn more about uh, British beer history. Pete, I'm going to go back to you. So, again, give us you know 19th century British beer history. Give us the whole gamut. Go for it. I, I want to hear. I want to learn. <laughs> So we were drinking porter at the start of the 19th century, uh, and uh, that was kind of the first industrial beer in the world. It was the first beer beer on an industrial scale. It was the uh, just the lifeblood of the masses, really. Uh, pale ale emerged as a kind of export beer. Uh, it wasn't called India Pale Ale when it went there. It was called India Pale Ale when it came back, when people came back from India having earned their fortunes. Uh, this was advertised in British newspapers as the kind of beer they drank in India, and so it took off. Uh, it took off at home, um, and became. It coincided with with glass uh, becoming affordable. So instead of kind of murky porter being drunk from pewter tankards, we had this beautiful golden beer uh, being served from glassware for the first time ever. And around the 1850s, IPA became the most fashionable drink uh, in the UK uh, through all levels of society. Then what happened is we had a kind of a white-collar uh, revolution. Uh, people were kind of uh, obliged to drink less. It's worth noting that IPA aged on the ship when it went to India. At home, if it didn't go to India, it was aged in cellars for up to a year in big barrels. So this was a beer like Porter. These beers were meant for aging. They were meant to be drunk mature, uh, barrel-aged, essentially. And then in, uh, we changed the laws on taxation so that beer was taxed on its ABV. And what we see then in the 1870s is the advent of quickly produced uh, beers that go straight into the trade, much lower ABV, going down to about four and five. And this is basically what we now call Cascale, real ale. Uh, and so what you see towards the end of the century is um, lower strength beers uh, being drunk quite quickly. And then British beer didn't react to the threat of lager. Um, you know, we had this kind of the greatest beer brand in the world going all over the world. 
the thing about IPA was it was it was good to drink in a in a in a warm climate, and lager brewers like Bex they went in uh, with a cool, crisp, refreshing beer, and the India Pale Ale brewers just didn't react to it, and so that's when Britain kind of lost its uh, its global dominance. Really, you know, one thing about that, uh, listen to that story, is how did people react to, to going from their nice, strong IPAs to having having to drink four or five percent beers? I mean. That must have been a huge cultural shift in Britain. It was, and we're undergoing a similar one now, um, where al- you know, alcohol was demonised. Um, uh, I mean, you guys know this better than anyone. You, you had prohibition. Um, but the same pressures were happening over here. Uh, we never quite got prohibition, but we came pretty close. Uh, and beer just got reduced and reduced and reduced. Uh, drinking was seen as a, as a sin, uh, as, as antisocial behaviour. Uh, and so, if you wanted to drink strong beer, you, you kind of had to keep quiet about it. And, and so, what happened was, uh, politicians and gentlemen from the gentlemen's clubs, where strong liquor was available, uh, but then everybody else, they said, "Well, drinking's bad. That's terrible. You should drink low-strength beer." <laughs> Jamie, uh, Pete, I have a question for you, specifically regarding the bottles that we found. Now, in the 1880s, can we, just by looking at the bottles or looking at the color of the beer in the bottles, can we glean any information off of that? Like, stylistic-wise, uh, was an IPA at that time uh, a, a considered a certain color, you know, a certain, uh, uh, did, it, did it have certain characteristics that, that if we find a bottle that's uh, a lighter in color or darker in color, that we can just cross off the list and say, okay, it's not an IPA, it's something else. So is, that, is that something that, that is, is relative or, you know, we're kind of barking up the wrong tree? You, you've hit on one of the great debates there. Um, uh, the speculation as to what color... <laughs> Excuse me. <coughs> the, the, the speculation as to what colour IPA was has, has raged through the through the decades. Really, um, we know that pale was pale relative to porter. That, that's all the word pale meant. Uh, we also know that British pale malt was what went on to become uh, lager malt in in uh, in Pilsen and in Pilsen lagers. They they were inspired by British lager malt. Sorry about British pale ale malt. So I think anything can. I'm just I'm just speculating here, but uh, I think anything kind of amber to pale would have been IPA uh, bitter, and then you probably, anything darker than that would probably be considered uh, porter. Great, Pete. And Captain Pat, you don't like demonizing alcohol, do you? Uh, No, I do not. Uh, But uh, I got a question for you, Pete. Um, Yeah. Refrigeration-wise, okay, now we're, we're talking about being cast in barrels and all. Uh, would this beer or lager that we have, um, would it be able to be, I, I guess you would have to, you'd be able to drink it non-refrigerated. And back then, um, they did drink it non-refrigerated. So, yeah. you know, does that add another twist to our story? You know, does it have yeah. to be refrigerated? Or, you know, what we're finding is no. obviously not, you know, unless it's, uh, yeah. I, I don't understand. This is what I've asked. This is one of our things, is that for some strange reason, uh, Britain took to refrigeration a lot later than the rest of the world did. Okay. So refrigeration is, re- refrigeration is one of the key reasons that, that lager spread and that big lager brands got these huge geographic reaches after having been very localized for so long. Uh, refrigeration and rail travel is, is what built brands like, pr- from Budweiser to Pilsner and Kell, really. Okay. And we just never went for it. Um, British, it's cold in Britain. We lived in cold, drafty houses. Uh, pub cellars were cool. So uh, I'm gonna talk in. You guys use Fahrenheit, don't you? Um, <laughs> I'm not. I'm not. I'm not going to be able to translate. But uh, but cellar temperature here was typically between 10 and 13 degrees Celsius. Uh, I can't translate that to Fahrenheit. Okay, um, so we got Google. Jamie, you know. <laughs> yeah, I think about forty-five, forty-five or so. You yeah. know, with this beer, yeah. uh, you know, with this, and that's co- that's common for you know for wine as well. When we, we say cellar temperature, I think it's all based on England and and like you, a beer or wine writers are referring to English temperatures. So, uh, yeah. this makes a lot of sense. You know, was it refrigerated when you know back in the day when it was coming across? Right. We don't know. It would not have been. So, so when, when the beer was, so India was the first big journey that these beers went on. Uh, from there, it went on around the world, and and the barrels were stored in the ship at ambient temperatures. I, I've read a lot of okay. uh, 
accounts that state that the beer was put in the lowest level of the ship uh, because that was the coolest place. Now, I spent three weeks on a sailing ship where our uh, bunks were below decks. And if you're below decks around the equator, it is not cool. It is 35 degrees Celsius. It's like, you know, 90 mm. uh, Fahrenheit. Yep, yep. And so these, okay. these, these beers had to put up with extraordinary uh, temperature variations. That was the thing about them. Uh, at different parts of the journey, they would be sitting in uh, 50 to 90 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, and that's what helped. That was part of the conditioning. So refrigeration wasn't a factor in these beer styles. All right. Can that help us out with kind of determining, you know, where it actually originated from? It's not from? a lager, right? Yeah, it's yeah. not a lager. I think we can say that. It's not a lager. Uh, if you're finding those really light-colored beers, they're almost straw-colored beers next to the darker-colored, the amber-colored beers. Yeah, I could... Yeah, I, mean, I think we know that at that time in New York, German lager-style beers were being made a lot, but it sounds like they weren't on the ship. Andy, you were d- diving down there, and you, you called wh- where you found the beers the hole. Does that mean that, that, that what Pete's saying is true, that w- those beers were stored at the lower level of the ship? Those beers are down in the bottom part of the ship, so we have to get through mud to get to it. That's why we, don't, we, we didn't, weren't able to access them earlier in our careers. It, it takes some getting to. And they're also mixed in with luggage, for the most part, right? Uh, in the same rough area? Right? It's, it's, there's no refrigeration system It's close. There. It's, yeah, close to it's the, definitely not refrigerated. It's yeah. close to one of the cargo holes. Yeah. Yeah. Let, let's yeah. keep asking Pete questions. I mean, I know some yeah. of you, done, you've been doing this your whole life, Pat. Tom, you, you went over to, to Liverpool. You want to ask any questions about beer at the time in Liverpool? You said you saw an advertisement uh, about IPA in the Liverpool yeah. press? Yeah, so one of, <laughs> just just through our, our research, uh, you know, we saw that there uh, one of the earliest mentions of IPA was out of Liverpool. I, I don't know if that's, you know, if you can confirm that or... I, I, I did find that mention uh, in the, um, the, arch- the, the newspaper archive of the British Library, uh, which has PDF scans of newspapers going back to about 1700. Uh, so I found the reference from 1982 of IPA in a Liverpool newspaper, um, which is the, that was the earliest reference we'd found at that point. Mm. Uh, Martin Cornell, who's another fantastic beer historian, wasn't very happy that I'd found the earliest mention, but he went <laughs> to the library and <laughs> spent a long time, and he, I think he found one mention that was earlier than that. So on, on that note, um, d- you, you said earlier, so many of the IPAs were from Burton area, like the Bass, the Alsips. Yeah. So you're saying, was Liverpool the closest port for those beers? Yes. So if they were, yes, there's was, a chance they're exported out of Liverpool. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so, sometimes I went out of London as well, but Liverpool was the first uh, shipment of all sops uh, to India. And on that uh, note, and Pete, well, I'm gonna, this is where I want to get to. Um, what I love is that not just there's British writers who write about beer. There's you. There's Martin Cornell. There's Ron Patterson. Those are just three that we know here in the states. I've met so, so many great British customers over the years who are able to talk eloquently about the beer in their glass, about a good pint. What is it about you guys? You guys are competing to be the best, most uh, articulate beer writers. <laughs> and over here, we can barely, we can barely define what an IPA is in America. I read something a long time ago about wine, which is that the British don't have a great reputation for making wine. But we have the greatest reputation of being wine critics. I think I think British people just. I think I think we're over analytical. I think we have too much time. It's cold. It's damp. It's raining, and we just sit there and analyze everything instead of just enjoying it. And Jamie, you know, you, you did a lot of research on this. And again, a couple months ago, you're on, and you suddenly just mentioned, "Oh, by the way, I dive Rex, and uh, I, yep, I made a yep. beer from the yeast." Yep. Well. Uh, it's been a project that's been ongoing, and it's really a labor of love. Uh, and to be able to, to put it out now uh, is just a real uh, uh, happy feeling for us because it's it's not only are we introducing a new beer, but we're sharing a little bit of our history, our local history, and our, and our maritime history with uh, with the world. And, and we're really happy to do that. We're proud to do that. So, yeah. And you guys, Pat, and, and how does the diving community feel about that there's a beer being made with uh – from bottles that you guys discovered on the I, wreck. I mean, I, you know, I think in general there's there's kind of a you know, there's this one side that says uh, you know we're, we're we shouldn't take things, and there's another side that realizes that the things that we're taking are uh, they're going to disappear. Right. You know, it's, and so but you're proud you're proud of the beer. I mean, are you guys going to be hanging out at yeah. oh, St. James Brewery on Long Island? Yeah, well, that's and that, and that's the thing. That's that's you know one of the things we're so grateful for. for 
that with Jamie, you know, it's, it's, you know, we, 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 we're, we're history buffs and, and we kind of want to take ourselves back to this time. And, and, you know, this is the first time that we can, I mean, really, truly take other senses besides, you know, just looking at things and touching things. And, and now we're, we've got so taste. L- last question for Pete. <laughs> so when uh, J- Jamie's new taste room is going to open up in, in May in Long Island. Yep. And he's doing this deep ascent line. What, how should they dress? <laughs> and, and what <laughs> any other implements Arr, like a pirate. of the trade <laughs> should, should they be drinking with or, you know, what do, any other things from that this time? Maybe the politics well, of the like time. You've already got the amazing uh, crystal glassware. Uh, that's mm. really exciting that you, you, you got some of the vessels that it was drunk from. Um, yeah, that's... There's a, sorry. Uh, that's going to be a great thing. The, the bottles themselves are going to be great. But, uh, yeah, please go ahead. I, I'm interested to hear yeah. exactly what you have to say. But uh, if you want to get in costume, and there's a great magazine that had these prints of different brewers. Uh, around this time, the brewers themselves were some of the powerfulest, most richest people in the country. And you want a long black uh, frock coat that goes down to your knees. <laughs> and a yes, big, absolutely. Uh, a big tall top hat. <laughs> And I was going to say some interesting facial hair, but uh, I don't know you guys, but the kind of facial hair that these people would have had back then is is back in style. If you look at places Jamie's like almost Brooklyn got it. And, uh, <laughs> well, <laughs> uh, hey, Pete, where I live in London, I, I got something to say. Um, digging in the uh, the first, I guess the first class cargo area, I did happen to uh, pull out a uh, a set of uh, clothing out of there. <laughs> And it was a, a, a set of uh, black long tails. And um, I still have it today. It's in perfect condition. My daughter actually put it on. And uh, she wore it for a couple of photos. And, uh, Amazing. Yeah. It's, um, it, it's, it's a testament to the time era. And uh, it's absolutely incredible, you know, what we're doing today. And we just want to make everybody aware of what we have here on Long Island. No, this, and, uh, this is really exciting show. And yeah. Again, Pete. So, um, just tell us again that what beer, sh- what book should we be uh, reading of yours one more time? Because uh, I'm getting more interested in this the more we talk. Uh, I think I think both Hops and Glory and Miracle Brew are the two that um, the two that really relate to this story, and they're the two that have been most successful in the states. I think they're they're the two that uh, people over there really seem to relate to. Are they cartoons? That's great. No, they're great. And then, Jamie, last uh, thing. Well, uh, my question, uh, Pete, is how about some period-era beers? Uh, you know, what, what, what should we be brewing in, uh, just to keep the, the history alive and, and to keep it relevant? Uh, you know, we talked about IPA and we talked about porter, but is there any other sort of obscure uh, 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 styles that we might want to venture into? Uh, well, a little bit later, you get to mild, uh, which is the one style that no one seems to be uh, being able to, uh, to revive, really. You know, Porter and IPA were the two hugely dominant styles, and they've been brought back in all kinds of shapes and forms. Uh, but, but mild was the drink that didn't really uh, go for export. It was the drink of uh, laborers, people who worked in factories, in mines, in mills. Oh my uh, it was maybe 2.5% dark, oh rich, malty, and uh, drunk in you know, 10 pints at a time uh, by, by these workers. Like us. Um, just getting, <laughs> so we're just getting started. <laughs> it sounds like you, you've got the new divers, the divers beer. Sure. He's going to make a Long Island mild ale. A, a mild ale? Uh, last question. What about the Russian IPA? Or, or the Imperial, uh, pardon me, the Imperial uh, Russian Stout? Uh, is, is, is that something from the 1800s that, that was uh, uh, consumed in, in England or... or, or uh... Well, it's kind of the prequel to the story of IPA, really. Um, the Burton Brewers were brewing these, these great beers for export to Russia and getting a great business out of it. And then the Napoleonic Wars just kind of killed that because uh, Napoleon Bonaparte did a, a blockade of the Baltic so the ships couldn't get through. And this is when Burton's Brewers, who were geared up to do big volume export beers, suddenly their market had disappeared and that's why they turned to India. Uh, and that's why they started to, to, to brew beers more suited to India. And for, for Samuel Alsop, it was it was a thing that saved his business. He was going to go under uh, until the East India Company said, "Well, do you think you could brew this pale beer for me and and send it to India?" And that's what saved the business and and started the IPA boom. 
That's amazing. Yeah. That's great. This That's is too damn cool. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for joining us. Guys, let's go around the room. Any last question from anyone? Or we're going to wrap this up. Everyone say your name and, and how we can contact you guys. Because uh, Captain- I know Oregon, the ship Oregon's on Wikipedia, but go for it. Uh, you can look me up, Captain Pat Rooney. Uh, just put in uh, Pat Rooney, scuba diver, and you'll see everything I'm involved in. And uh, that's about it. There's a photo of the shark biting your leg. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, raising of the uh, Oregon anchor, you know, retrieved the anchor off of the Oregon, uh, four tons. And how deep are you, are you uh, licensed to dive? Um, well, we found a 550, the U550 off of uh, our coast, uh, I guess, five years ago now. It's in uh, 347 feet of water. Do it in meters. Uh, no, I can't do it in meters. I'm sorry. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's... Uh, so you're a legend. We're, we're, we're thank- it, so thankful a, that you came on. Thank and, you. Uh, thank you, Pete. Andy. I'm Captain Andy. You can see anything I've ever done probably at East Coast Wreck Diving. And uh, I was... I'm not, any, I, I don't, I'm not an active uh, instructor anymore. I'm getting too but old. But East Coast Wreck Diving, East that's on Coast Twitter, diving. too. Yeah. And Tom? Yeah, and Captain Tom, and uh, you can find us at eastcoastrecdiving.com. All right. And last but not least, I'm Jamie Adams from St. James Brewery. You can find us on our website or also on our Facebook page. Thanks. And, and Pete Brown, thanks for staying up late with us. Thank you, Pete. Thank you Come so much. Um, Pete. It's so great to hear this story. Thank you. It's really, I'm really grateful. All right. We learn more. Every, this, is a, this is a really great and, and, and educational ex- experience for all of us, and uh, it makes you want to drink... Uh, not just IPAs, but Miles, too. Guys, big shout-out to everybody. Thanks to our producer, Justin Kennedy. Thanks, Our engineer Justin. today is Gene. Thank you, Justin. Um, intern and assistant producer, Dylan Hoyer. Uh, been a great show. I'm Jimmy Carboni, the host. Thanks for joining us on the Heritage Radio Network. We'll catch you next time on Beer Sessions Radio. All right. Thank you. Woo-hoo. Thank you. Let's go diving for some beer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>